230 heavenly sunlight. saved as a 14 year old boy and he sent from that point on he spent his entire life around Christian music in fact he wrote uh, upwards of 1500 hymns and Christian poems and so he dedicated his entire life to serve the Lord do you think about this song that we're singing that second verse talks about shadows around me shadows above me never conceal my Savior and guide well folks we are here to worship the Lord here today and to focus on that heavenly sunlight. And I'm glad that even when things are going so haywire around us, that we still can look up and sometimes God will just kind of roll the clouds away and that ray of heavenly sunlight will shine down into our soul. It is our hope and our prayer that God will shine some of that heavenly sunlight on your soul here this morning. And so let's continue on this second verse. Welcome to the service. Welcome all of you live stream viewers as well. Let's have a great time as we worship and serve the Lord in spirit and truth here this morning. On the second verse. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and God. He is the light, in Him is the darkness, ever I'm walking close to His side. Bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Morning. Good morning. Good to be here today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do once again thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, Lord. And Lord, want to pray for the ones that couldn't be here today, Lord, that are not feeling well, Lord. Think of Brother Joe, especially, Lord, is just hurting, couldn't be here, Lord. And Lord, there's many others here today, Lord, that have aches and pains, and Lord, have come in here on canes and walkers, Lord. And Lord, what an encouragement to see him come to church anyway, Lord. Thank you so much for their zeal to come out to church this morning. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, we just pray for everybody here, Lord, that they get from your word today what they need, Lord. And Lord, we pray especially, Lord, for that one here today that needs you as their savior, Lord. Uh, we just pray that you talk to their heart even now for that great need in their soul. We thank you for who you are and what you've done for us, and we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Over to number 24, and can it be number 24? Oh, 
some announcements and uh, I know it's, it's customary for the pastor to introduce his own family but uh, his sister Kim's here his niece Holly we've known Kim and Brian Johnson more years really than I've even known pastor and I just I just want to publicly say how much we love you appreciate you so glad to see you here and I know you've been a blessing and encouragement to our pastor your brother just want to thank you for that publicly glad to have you here so this evening, we have Kids Choir 515 meet in the chapel, and then evening service at 6. We have a teen activity after, and we hope the teens, so if you've been promoted into the teen class, several of you have, I know Austin has, and Ella, Josie, and Hannah, and we got many that are moving up into there, and their families have been invited to the snack Sunday night after church, got Hungry Howie's Pizza and some other stuff. Looking forward to all that, and that'll be down on the fellowship immediately following the evening service. So Monday, August 28th, that is tomorrow, widow's meeting in the chapel. If got any questions about that, please see Brother James Childress. Tuesday, men's Bible study at 701 Wills Way. You can see Brother Bobby, Brother Terry, myself, pastor, and we'll give you some details on that. Sure hope to see some other men able to come and join that study. Wednesday, August 30th, this is the big night. This is when Masters Club starts off uh, officially for this new year, and I hope our, our leaders are ready. Uh, we've covered some things, and uh, we hope the young people bring your vests, our leaders, wear your Masters Club shirts. We knew we had a couple that didn't have them. We ordered them. They're available. You can see Sister uh, Christina about that, but we'll be kicking that off on Wednesday. And of course, the youth group will be meeting regularly again downstairs in the teen room at the same time. And then upstairs here in the auditorium, pastor will be leading Bible study and prayer meeting. So that's all coming up this week. And then Saturday is our monthly men's prayer breakfast. It will be here at Temple Baptist Church down in the Fellowship Hall, 8 a.m. We do have a guest preacher that's going to be here <clears throat> to speak to the men uh, following breakfast, and then we'll have a time of prayer. And since it is the beginning of the month for street ministry, we will be meeting at the park downtown uh, with the, the, the park named after the pecan tree. I think there's like three trees left there. But anyways, it's, they're still there. We still meet there, and we'll be going across the street corners to hold up our scripture signs. And then some things that are coming up. Jolly Seniors, see Brother Jerry TV Paw about that, and that is September 7th on a Thursday, and then September 9th we have our Back to School Bash, and that is going to be from 2 to 7. There's going to be, we have flyers in the back, please get that out. Uh, we've invited some other churches as well to participate in that. It is open to our church. Uh, there is going to be a time of some preaching. We do have some food planned, so it is going to be a, a good time. And hopefully a great time, too, to do some outreach. So if you know some people who used to be a part of the church or kind of on the edge and uh, haven't been around, invite them to come. Let's do what we can to minister to them, to outreach.
Thank you, Brother Max. Uh, Pecan Park, Saturday at noon. There's only three trees left, but there will be plenty of nuts gathered around. <laughs> I can promise you that. Amen. Ushers, come on forward. Let's receive the offering. And I, I would like to just uh, say amen to what Brother Max said about my sister and my niece being here. My, my sister only... The Lord knows the Christian influence that my sister and her husband, uh, Brian Johnson, have had in my life, not only me getting right with the Lord, but just throughout my ministry, and uh, we're so glad that, um, that Kim and Holly could be here, and Holly's had some surgery and procedures up in Baltimore, and so I would encourage you to pray for her and for her recovery, that all the procedures that she's been through would be effective in in helping her. Brother Brett Williamson, would you ask the Lord's blessings on the offering, please? Amen. Thank you for that offertory. Number 150, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. 150, and we'll stand as we sing. <laughs> Died and that 
he died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. we had another song to go <laughs> like come on brother john <laughs> get up here <laughs> get up here you big dummy <laughs> all right sister lynn before you sit down uh, sister lynn honey i need you up here all right i need your help here with this this is this takes some teamwork here all right, thank you kids for singing that song, and uh, that, we had a lot of fun watching those kids sing that song in Ecuador, and you know, it's really how ironic that they sang that song about walking and leaping and praising God with my niece here. You don't, probably don't even remember this, do you, Holly? No, I've been told enough. You've been told enough. Yeah, my sister knows this, so anyhow, I won't tell it. Until next week when she's gone. <laughs> Numbers chapter 12. Wait, wait, wait. I thought 
I messed up here. Come up here, honey. All right. We want to uh, wish a happy birthday to Sister Karen Harding. Sister Karen, you come. She is our church treasurer, does a great job, and uh, she uh, uh, took over for Sister Dawn here this past year, and uh, just there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes, keeping up the books and making sure that the pastor gets his paycheck all that good important stuff and so we want you to know we love you and appreciate you and uh, keep up the good work all right thank you all right there we go all right all right numbers chapter number 22 i'll try to get uh, a lot of things going on my my i'm really burdened about the message here this morning and so um just uh, bear with me, and uh, I definitely, uh, definitely want to be faithful to the Lord here this morning. And so, number chapter number 22, and when you get there, would you please stand? Let's read our text and um, dive right into the message here this morning. Number chapter 22, and verse number 20, and God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, if the men come to call thee... Rise up and go with them, but yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. Now, let me just say this. If you read the previous chapter and the previous verses of this chapter, you see that God had specifically told Balaam not to go with these men. And now we find that God's saying, go with them. And so you have to take the entire context in mind in order to understand. There are no contradictions in this text. There, anytime you see an apparent contradiction, there's probably a lesson that God's really trying to, to speak and say, and that's exactly what we find right here. Now, verse number, uh, verse number uh, where am I at here? Verse number 21 and Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. And God's anger was kindled because he went. Now, we would think, well, that doesn't make sense. God just said, go with them, but just don't say anything that I didn't tell you to say. God's anger was kindled, and it says, The angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now, he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. The ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards, and a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. When the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself unto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. When the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. The Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, and I would, there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. I, you know, I'm, I'm amazed that, that Balaam would even reply. I mean, wouldn't you just go... <laughs> You'd be so amazed that here this donkey is speaking. This is, this is not Mr. Ed, by the way. And, and, and Balaam's just going on like this is a normal thing, and he's arguing with the donkey. Uh, if I had a sword, I'd kill you right now. It's just all of this is happening so fast, and there's things going on that Balaam can't even see, and this is what's going on in the story. In verse number 30, And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. The angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, 
I went out to withstand thee because, watch this, thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. I want to preach to you this morning on a very sobering thought, something that I was actually preparing to preach something totally different about a week ago. And as I was preparing for something else, the Lord, I believe the Holy Spirit, just completely drew my attention to this text and to this concept. What I want to preach about is God's killing business. We just read about how this supposed prophet of God came within, came this close to being killed because of his way being perverse. And I'll say more about it here in the message, but here's a man that he thinks that he can manipulate God, and he's trying to figure out a way around what God said, and we see so much of that. We see so much perverse uh, Christianity today, people trying to do whatever they want and just figuring out how far can I go and still get away with it with God. And that's exactly what is in Balaam's heart. And so when, you know, God will put you through tests and he'll put you in situations to manifest what is in your heart. That's exactly what is going on. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us here this morning. Father, thank you for the privilege to be in church today. Thank you for all these that have come, all that are viewing on live stream and all who will perhaps listen to this message in the future. Uh, help us, Lord. We need your help. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And God, we want to honor you here today, and we want to represent you in a factual and uh, in a truthful manner. Uh, we're surrounded by uh, so much religion that just picks and chooses the parts of the Bible and the aspects of you that they want to hear, but just completely reject or ignore the aspects of you that uh, that aren't what we want to hear. And I pray that we wouldn't be that way here at this church, and we certainly wouldn't be that way here today. We just pray for your help and blessings. If anyone's listening that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, we pray that this would be the day that you get a hold of their heart and bring them to a saving knowledge of you. Perhaps there would be believers here today that uh, need to understand that, God, you are a God that is holy. You're a powerful God. And Lord, how close that Balaam came to the end of his life at this moment, and he didn't even see it, he didn't even understand it until you opened his eyes, and perhaps there'd be someone here today that needs their eyes opened. Uh, we pray, God, that you would uh, work and use this message today for your glory and honor, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, you may be seated. God's killing business, boy, that's a positive title, isn't it? But I will say this, it is a positive message. Uh, I am positive that God does kill people. <laughs> so it is positive. God's killing business. Well, it's really not a business, but I will say this, what God does is his business. And we need to always remember that. There's a drama going on here between God and Balaam, which demonstrates the depravity of human nature. And it also demonstrates divine sovereignty and legitimate volition. We talked a little bit about this in the young adult Sunday school class. God has a sovereign plan and God has a will, but he gave us, he gave Adam and all of Adam's descendants, he created us in his image and we are different than the animal kingdom in the sense that we have volition, we have a soul. And that gives us free will to choose. And that's not just a facade that God has created. He is sovereign and he does whatever he wills. But yet the decisions that he gives for us to make are very genuine. And Balaam demonstrated that. Balaam had one thing. He was wanting to go one direction. He was desiring some glory and some reward. He was, he was wanting to finally get recognized for his prophetic ministry because many of God's men do not get recognized here in this earth. They 
They'll get recognized if they're faithful to God. There will be recognition in the next life. But many of God's men serve faithfully and they plow their field and they, they, they're faithful to Him and yet they don't get to experience the joy and the results of their ministry. Sometimes men plow and sow seeds and the next generation gets to enjoy some fruit and some harvest. But Balaam did not feel recognized and he had the opportunity to get some recognition and some reward from a pagan king. A pagan king that was trying to hire Balaam to curse the nation of Israel, the nation whom God had blessed. And Balaam had went through several different incidents trying to figure out a way in order to get God to do his will rather than figuring out how to do God's will. We see some good qualities in Balaam. He said, I'm not going to say anything that God didn't say to say. And so there are some good qualities, just enough to make Balaam an anomaly, trying to figure out where he's coming from. Balaam, in this incident, he escapes death. He, he finally yields to what God is trying to do in his life. He yields his will, but he doesn't yield his heart to the Lord. He survives, but... This apparent loophole that he finds in doing what he wants to do, the path to glory is very short-lived. Numbers 31, this is not too many days after this happens. Numbers 31, verse number 8, it says, They slew the kings of Midian, beside the rest of them that were slain. Balaam also, the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. Balaam finds himself yoking up with the Midianites and the Moabites. He shouldn't have even been there to begin with. And when God blessed the children of Israel and they went to battle against their enemies, Balaam happened to be out of the will of God, and he ended up dead anyways. Not by this angel who had the sword drawn, ready to slay. I mean, uh, Balaam's donkey rescued him from that, but ultimately... He ended up dead. There's a lesson there that you're not going to manipulate God. You're not going to do an end around with the Lord. Some of you young people, you, you will learn different ways to do an end around with your parents or with your teacher or with someone in authority. You can do that. That happens sometimes. But you'll never, ever get away with it with God. Now, the first aspect of God's killing business I want to talk about is just give you a little bit of review, just hit some highlights of some holy executions in the Scripture. Here's some notable examples, not all of them, but some things that are certainly noteworthy. We find in the Word of God that God killed an entire civilization, civilization during the time of Noah. God looked down upon all of humanity with the exception of Noah, and he said that the thoughts and the imaginations of man's heart is only evil continually from his youth. And it was to the point that God said, I wish I would have never made man. God made Adam, and God made him in his image, and it was God's desire to have fellowship with Adam, and God walking with Adam in the cool of the garden, and all of these things showed that God had a desire to fellowship with the man that he created, but don't think that God needed man. God's always been sufficient in and of himself. But God had a desire that man, the Bible says in the book of Revelation that all things were created for his glory, for his pleasure. God's not up there for us. We are here for him. That is, if you want to find some purpose in life, then you need to quit looking this way and you need to start looking this way. That's the only way that we will find anything that will truly bring satisfaction and fulfillment in our life. So an entire civilization, except for Noah and his family, God wiped them out. We find that there was an entire valley, two cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. And God wiped them out with fire and brimstone, why? Because of their sexual perversion. They were, a, a, they were a, an area and a culture that was given to their form of LGBTQ plus and whatever the next letter that's to come along. 
that's what was going on and you can deny it all you want, you can criticize the preacher all that you want, but that's exactly what the Word of God says. God put up with it for years and He sent those angels to go check it out. Not that God needed that, but God, you know, God's going to demonstrate to man everything within his power that, hey, I'm not trying, I'm not wanting to wipe you out. God does not want to be in the killing business. We'll see that here in just a few minutes. But he sends those angels and he said the cry of them, the wickedness, it's almost as if God all the way up in heaven, he's just, he's kind of getting a, a stench of that wickedness. You, you, ever, you ever walk by something that was dead, you didn't know, you were just like, what is that? I just got a whiff of something that was dead. It might be a mouse or some kind of critter, and it's just like it's there. And God's, God's getting a whiff of that, and so he checks it out. And sure enough, it was as wicked as he already knew, but God ended up destroying them. He killed Lot's wife when he tried to pull Lot and his wife and daughters out of Sodom so that they would be rescued, and Lot... His wife turned around because she wasn't glad that she was being rescued. She was only sad that that wicked place was being destroyed. So God turned her into a pillar of salt. We read about two sons of Judah. Could have been in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Ur, the Bible says, the oldest son of Judah was wicked before the Lord. And the Bible just says simply, and God slew him. He had a younger brother by the name of Onan the inventor of the generator. Just joking. Anybody ever heard of owning generators? All right. Well, you could have laughed and made me feel a little. That's dumb, preacher. Onan, all right, after Ur was killed by God, Onan was supposed to, according to God's law, they didn't have any children, so he was supposed to take his brother's wife, and raise up seed. And, you know, he just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get what I want, but not what I don't want. And God saw that. I'm not going to get into that. It's a little bit, uh, you've got to have some discretion with that story. But God saw what he did, and so God slew him also. Uh, do you know that God almost killed Moses? Oh, yeah, God God almost killed Moses. It says in Exodus 4, verse 24, and it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. It wasn't because he was getting ready to stay at the wrong hotel. If you read the story, it's because Moses married Zipporah, a Midianite, and there's a backstory there that God doesn't give us the details, but I think I know what's going on. God said of the Jewish people, your, your male children on the eighth day are supposed to be circumcised. Zipporah is not a Jew, and so she's like, you're not doing that to my boy. And Moses is just, Moses is kind of that kind of passive-aggressive type leader. Moses is the kind that, you know, you can run over him and he'll change your oil a couple times, but when he's had enough, he's going to kill you. And that's Moses, and Moses is just kind of putting up with stuff and putting up with it, and, you know, he's not, he's not putting his foot down and saying to Zipporah, no, God said we're going we're gonna to circumcise uh, this boy, and so he's just kind of being passive, and finally God says, he's not getting it. I've been speaking to him. He's been putting it off and procrastinating, and so on the way to the end, God Sought to kill him, and Moses said, okay, and so you can read the rest of the story. Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire before the Lord. They said, God, we, we don't want to worship you your way. We want to worship. We like this incense. We like the way that this smells, and this is what we're going to offer to you. If they were alive today, they'd be saying, well, we like this music, and this is how we want to worship you, and we want to worship you our way. We don't care what your word says. We don't care what you like. We, we, this is the way we want it, and our hearts are sincere, just like Cain, our, where we get our heritage from. And God said, nothing doing, and Nadab and Abihu, God killed them. You have Korah, Dathan, and Abiram and their families that 
they stood up against God and Moses and they said, oh, you're just a my way or the highway kind of leader here and God spoke to us too and Moses, you're just, Moses and Aaron, you're just taking too much on yourself and Moses, I mean, Moses is broken hearted about it. Moses goes and talks to God and God said, you might want to step back from them a little bit. And literally, these rebels who were rebelling against God's authority and God's man, God opened up the earth and swallowed them down into the pit. They went to hell alive and their families. And then after that, guess what? Moses didn't do anything. He's just following God. He's doing right. He's obeying the Lord. They stand up against Moses. And so God opens up the earth and swallows them down into the pit. And then you have a bunch of Israelites that saw that. And so they start complaining and accusing Moses of killing the people of the Lord. And Moses is like, I didn't do anything. And so they start griping and complaining and God hears it. And so God kills 14,700 Israelites with a plague and it would have been more, but Moses did everything he could to stop that plague. And so, I mean, Moses didn't want him to die, but God's like, you know what? I've had it with you. I've had it with your complaining and all of this. And God is concerned about his glory and honor. And we need to remember that the God that is being preached about in pulpits today is a God after man's own making. And you young people that are being educated today in public education and uh, the universities and whatnot, they are, they are presenting, if they present to you any God whatsoever, it's not the God of this Bible. Because the God of this Bible is holy. They say, preacher, this is old fashioned hellfire and damnation preaching. Listen, I, I you need to know the truth. Wouldn't you, I mean, if you're one breath away, if you're living a life and God's been speaking to you and God's been trying to draw you to him and you're one breath away from God saying, I've had enough, you'd want to be warned, wouldn't you? I read about 24,000 Israelites who died because of their sexual immorality with the Moabites. And then just one more. And I could say there, there's all kinds of examples in the Bible. How about Uzzah? Uzzah was a Levite. And his ministry was to take care of the ark of God. And they're, I mean, they're living in a time of religious dysfunction. Everything is messed up. The Philistines had captured the ark of the covenant and God smote the Philistines with emrods and all kinds of plagues and so forth. So the Philistines said, we don't want the ark of God. Uh, God's too holy. And so they sent the ark back. But the ark didn't go back to the tabernacle where it was supposed to be. So David, finally, when he became king and everything was at peace, he said, we need to bring the ark of the covenant back to the tabernacle where it belongs. It needs to be put back in the holy of holies. David has good intentions. Uzzah, no doubt, had good intentions. So they're carrying the ark in a cart that's being drawn by oxen. That's not the way it was supposed to be. Those Levites were supposed to put those wooden staves, those rods, wooden uh, dowels, if you will, through those rings, and they were supposed to carry it on their shoulders, not on an ox cart. And as that oxen stumbled, the cart shook a little bit, and Uzzah, with good intentions, reached up and he put his hand to stabilize the ark. He touched it. God killed him dead right then and right there. So, wow, God is such a mean God. You know, let me just say this to you. I found this interesting. I, I, I did a little, I wanted to just save some time on chronicling some of these. And so I did a Google search on times when God killed people. Do you know that I found a website that chronicled all of these? And you could look it up yourself. But 
all of the presentation of all of these was worded and then commented afterward in a way to discredit God. It was put together at, by an agnostic or an atheist. And you know what? You ought to look it up. You say, what, you, you're, you're trying to get me to read the work of an agnostic and an atheist that's trying to get me to not believe in God? Hey, help yourself. Help yourself. I, I'm not trying to win an argument with you about God. If what I'm saying is true, it, you're going to have to decide whether you believe it or not. Listen to what the other side has to say. If you want to reject God, help yourself. I just don't recommend it. Uzzah touched the ark. And you know, David even was displeased with the Lord over that. It kind of ruined his day. It ruined their party in bringing the ark back. And it's a reminder that God's business is far more important than our business and our feelings. Listen, God, I'm not saying that God doesn't want you to be happy. I like what Brother Carl said to the men yesterday morning. You know, God is far more interested in our holiness than he is our happiness. But we also need to remember that the two don't have to be, they don't have to conflict with one another. You can be holy and happy. Now, if you don't trust God and you just love the world, then you don't think that I can be holy and happy. But the good news is, is that in Jesus Christ, you can be both. In the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira played religious pretenders. Yeah, we sold, sold our property for this much and we gave it all to God. But the truth was they kept half of it to themselves. They were trying to, they wanted everybody to think that they were more spiritual than what they were. God killed them both. King Herod was given a speech before a public oration before the people, and they liked his talk so much that they were all going, oh, it is the voice of a God and not of a man. And you know what Herod did? It was pretty good, wasn't it? And he took credit for that, and God smote him dead right there, and the description, he was eaten of worms. He dropped over dead, and Probably all of his secret service men came up, what happened? Our king is dead. And then they probably saw the worms coming out of him. That would have been a pretty gory sight. That's the holiness of God that we're talking about. There are lines that we can cross. And I'll say more about the mercy of God here in just a few minutes. But I also wanted to mention to you, I'm not going to say much in this next topic, and that is personal observations and suspicions. I have opinions and I'm not going to talk about these because I don't know but I do know this there's a great sermon out there by J. Harold Smith called God's Three Deadlines. How many have ever heard that sermon or heard of it? You ought, to, you ought to Google it. God's Three Deadlines. It's a classic of all time and only God knows how many thousands of people have become Christians because of that man of God's sermon. But I've had people in my ministry and in my life that I've had strong suspicion that God killed them. And because of the fact that I don't know it for a fact, I don't know it for sure, and because, you know, if I started talking and describing certain things, there are people either here or in live stream land that could perhaps uh, listen to what I'm saying and connect the dots and put two and two together and I would rather not even go into all of that but suffice it to say I know of easily a dozen situations where I look back and I compare what I know about what was going on and about what the word of God says and what at least what my spirit tells me none of those are infallible but sometimes the Holy Spirit does speak to us. And I would have to say, you know, I'm pretty sure that that person, they crossed a line. They either crossed a line or they went too long resisting God, rebelling against God, and God said, I've put up with it long enough. It's time. I've known people who have had horrible false, allegedly false claims against them 
that in my mind appeared to be legitimate, but they were denied adamantly, and I know of a number of cases where it wasn't too many, too many months or years later that they ended up dead. And perhaps you know of some situations before that you've observed and you just kind of go, hmm, can't help but wonder about that. And so is God still in the killing business? Yeah, that's a question that we all have. People say, well, that's the, that's the, the old God. It's the one of the Old Testament. That's the antiquated God. It seems like God's not that way anymore. God doesn't judge people. God doesn't get angry. God doesn't kill anybody. But let me show you what the Word of God says. In Romans chapter 8 and verse number 13, it says, For if ye, speaking to Christians, if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You know, there's a difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. The biggest difference is not just our eternal destination. So many people think that getting saved does nothing more than change my eternal destination. Salvation means that there's a work of regeneration that takes place in our life. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit of God literally comes inside of our heart. It comes inside of our body. And so the Holy Spirit is inside of us. And God says here, if you live after the flesh, then you're going to die. That's as plain as the nose on your face. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse number 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise." I had a young man ask me just not long ago, preacher, what do, you, what do you think about these people that just live wickedly and they say that they're saved and they just keep living and just seems like they're fine and they're happy with it? And I think of verses like this and I, you know, I'm not God's fruit inspector. I, I, I can't judge whether anybody's saved. I, I remember a time in my life where I doubted my own salvation and, I, and God had to get me through that and I had to Go to the Word of God and get my assurance from the Bible. But I do know this. God said that to a Christian, if you live wickedly, if you defile His temple, if you live after the flesh, the result very well may be death. Now, I don't know the when. I don't know how much that God would put up. He's merciful and He's long-suffering. But this tells me that there is a time where God says, enough is enough. I'm tired of living in your filthy house. I'm tired of smelling your garbage. I've been putting up with it, and I just can't put up with it anymore. You're toast. 1 John 5, verse number 16 says, If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. You see somebody commit a sin as a believer, we should be praying and saying, God, be merciful. God, help them. Listen, God's, God's men and disciples and Christians should not have this attitude. Oh, they did wickedness. God, God, kill them. The disciples had that attitude. Should we rain down fire? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit ye are of. The Son of Man came not to destroy men's lives, but to save men's lives. But then he goes on to say that there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. God says if somebody sins a sin unto death, then don't pray for it. You say, how do I know what that is? Well, I will say this. If you're praying for somebody, I've had times where the Lord just said, no, I don't want you praying for him. So what, what does it hurt? Why couldn't God just ignore your prayers? Well, it's because of the nature of prayer. You know that God told Jeremiah to stop praying for Israel? 
he basically said, Jeremiah, I don't want to hear it anymore. And I believe that God told Jeremiah that because Jeremiah's prayers meant something to God. You, you, if you love your kids, there's times where your kids will ask you for something and you're, it's like you want to say yes to them, but you know it's not best. And that's the way God was just like, you know what, I just don't want to hear this anymore. That's how powerful that prayer is between God's children and our Heavenly Father. And sometimes God will just say, no. You say, well, how do you, what do you do if you don't know for sure? Just keep praying. Just keep praying. But we see here, according to the doctrine of the Bible, that God is still in the killing business. Now, what is God's purpose in killings? I, I can't tell you every specific, but let me give you a couple of examples that we need to know and understand. In Exodus 14, in verse number 31, And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. God killed Pharaoh and the entire Egyptian army in the Red Sea, and he did it right in front of the children of Israel. And the reason that God says is that they would fear God and they would fear his man. They would recognize that God is indeed powerful. Now, that was very short-lived, and we understand that. But God will do things to cause us to fear him. You know, there are people in authority that God uses to instill the fear of God. Parents sometimes will teach us to fear God. You disobey, there's going to be retribution. I was reminded of a cute little story. My nephew, this would be Holly's cousin, uh, he was just a little guy. He's probably four or five years, years old. The church in Idaho, the head usher, his last name was Gunter. And he was known as the Gunter. He was the head usher, but he was always out in the foyer. And I mean, he made sure that kids did not go running in church. He made sure that kids didn't make a mess. If he saw a kid doing something that they weren't supposed to be doing, he was not weak-hearted about it. He didn't go and talk to the parent. He just made sure that, hey, you stop. And I mean, he was pretty heavy-handed. And so he was known by all the children as the Gunter. My nephew Andrew is just a little guy, and they're in Sunday school, and he's overheard talking to all of these other little kids. He says, beware of the Gunter. The Gunter will kill you. That's what, that's what they saw because here's a guy, here's a no-nonsense guy that's laying down. The rules are the rules. You're not going to cross the rules. And he put the fear of the gunter in them. Sometimes God will do things because it's for our good to fear him. Acts chapter 5, verse number 11. After God killed Ananias and Sapphira, it said... And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. There was an explorer in the deepest Amazon jungle and he finally, he suddenly finds himself surrounded by a bloodthirsty group of natives. After surveying his situation, he quietly says to himself, I'm toast. <laughs> this ray of light breaks forth from the sky and a voice booms out, no. You are not toast. Pick up that stone in front of you and attack the chief. So the explorer picks up the stone and proceeds to smite the chief with a deadly blow. He's breathing heavily while standing above the sprawled out chief. Surrounding him are 100 native warriors with a look of shock on their faces. The voice booms out again. Okay, now you're toast. <laughs> How often in our immature view of the fear of God do we have this superstitious idea about the fear of God, about like God is just looking for an opportunity to get you. If I, you know, if I give this up in my life or if I yield the preacher's preaching and yeah, I know it to be true, but if I do that, then God's going to ruin my life. 
don't you think God can ruin your life without your permission if he wanted to? Absolutely. Absolutely. But we think that we're hanging on to this facade of control when the one who loves us and wants our best, he, he wants his best in our life for our good and for his glory. We think that, well, I, I trust you enough to save me from hell, but, you know, just, I got this from here. And it's just a it's this ridiculous concept. Well, you know, if I, I better be careful if I say this, God's going to get me. Well, most of it's superstitious. Let me say this, and I'll move on here. We may never know the purpose of God's judgment, but we can absolutely know his nature. I, I can't tell you why God does what he does but I can tell you who he is. And here's his nature. Exodus 33, verse number 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? That's the nature of God. That's the heart of our God. Yes, God's in the killing business, but God takes no pleasure in it. God is holy and Yet he is merciful. Hebrews 12 verse 29 says, For our God is a consuming fire. Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And so if all this is true, then what can we do? What can you and I do with this truth? This is not just something that we go, Oh, well, God's... God kills people. This is not an interesting fact. This is something we need to understand and figure out there's something we should do with it. First of all, don't listen to vain words. Vain words can come from other people, from even other preachers. Vain words can come from within your own mind. But Ephesians 5 verse number 6 says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things... Cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. You say, I see people all around. They say that they're saved and they live wickedly and nothing happens to them. Well, I'm telling you, it's probably likely that they're not saved. You, you, do you know that God will put up with more sin in the life of a lost person than he will in the life of a saved person? You're his child. He lives inside of you. There's things that other people can get away with that you will not. Don't listen to those vain words. How about self-judgment? 1 Corinthians 11 and verse number 30. You ought to look this up. This is the, the context of this is the Lord's Supper. And he, the Bible says that if you partake of communion unworthily, then you partake, you, you are, it, it's a horrible sin. You are guilty of the body and blood of Jesus. You're basically saying, I believe in what Jesus did for me, but I'm basically rubbing my sin in his face. And this is what the Lord says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That means that God will make you weak. There will be a health crisis, a sickness, and if you don't repent, there are some, those sleeping right there, that's not talking about your, your rest. He's saying God will kill you. God is still in the killing business. And this is believers who take the Lord's Supper lightly. He says, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. God's saying, you can fix this. You don't have to just sit and do nothing and wait for my hammer to, to drop. You can get right with God. God's saying, I want you to. You know, there are some believers that have never or seldom partaken in communion. Listen, I, I mean this with all goodwill. I understand there are some people that just come to church on Sunday morning. And I love you. And I'm glad you're here. And I hope you'll keep coming. But some of you are truly born-again Christians. And we have communion you know, once every quarter on a Sunday night, and you haven't partaken in communion as a believer, 
maybe ever or for years because it's not important enough to you to come back on a Sunday night for communion. What does that say about how much Jesus means to us? I'm not throwing a guilt trip your way. I'm just trying to get us to see God's perspective on our life. We can't come back another time. Communion is supposed to be a very important part of the Christian life. There's two things that the Lord says that he expects for a believer to be scripturally baptized after your salvation and then to partake in communion. And some people, it's just not important enough. You say, well, I'm not right with God. I don't want to do it unworthily. Well, get right with God and have communion and have fellowship with Jesus Christ. There are lines and links that should not be crossed and God is merciful and long-suffering, but I would not recommend that you presume that upon him. Just because God has been patient and long-suffering with you up till now, that is no guarantee, no guarantee of how much longer that he will put up with your sin. And so what you need to do, what do we need to do with this truth is we need to repent. Acts 17 and verse number 30, Paul said, at the times of this ignorance, God winked at. He momentarily closed one eye. He's not, he's not blind to your sin, but he just kind of closes an eye and he, he doesn't want to see it. He, but now, he says, he commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men and that he hath raised him from the dead. That man is Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to, he is Savior, but ultimately he's going to be judge. We live in a world that is judging God, but it will not always be so. We talked about Nineveh in Sunday school this morning. Nineveh was a wicked city. Jonah went a day's journey and he said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. You got 40 days until God's killing business is going to set up shop right here. And he didn't preach a very good sermon, but he just told them the truth. Wasn't what they wanted to hear, but they knew that it was true. And so the, entire, the, the, the king and the entire city repented of their wickedness. Wouldn't you like to see that in America today? Wouldn't you like to see a great city? New York or Los Angeles or uh, Statesville. Just respond to a simple, truthful message and get right with God. Psalm 7, verse number 11, God judgeth the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. God's there, there comes a time where God says, enough's enough. I got my sword sharpened. I got my arrows ready. If you won't repent, if you won't get right with God, then judgment is coming. In conclusion, and I'm just about done here. Our opening text, we have Balaam that's smiting his donkey. That, that donkey is the messenger. That donkey ends up crushing Balaam's foot. It's like, that was, the donkey was actually doing the best thing. If the donkey hadn't have spoke up, if the donkey hadn't have tried to veer away from that angel, then Balaam would have been dead right then and right there. God used a donkey as a messenger. It wasn't a very eloquent messenger. The messenger wasn't handsome. Probably the messenger's voice was not very smooth or pleasant but he told the truth. And so often today, God's messengers are being smitten by accusation, by people. They're, God's messengers aren't telling people what they want to hear, and so they make accusations, and they call them names, and Pharisees, and judgmental, and hateful, and they use that as an, as an excuse to bl ultimately blame God. I hear it. It's a spirit of the age. I hear it all the time. 
pointing toward a messenger or somebody that was there that's standing for what's right and true. People reject it. And they think that they can ease their conscience by blaming their direction in life that, well, the, the preacher just, he wasn't perfect or my parents weren't perfect. And God and his love if you don't get anything this morning, get this. God in his love placed all of his wrath against you on his son, Jesus Christ. Everything that you deserve, his wrath, your sin, all of that, he took that and he placed it on his son Jesus Christ and on the cross of Calvary the Bible says that he who knew no sin that's Jesus became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him that was that moment in space and time where Jesus cried out and he said my God my God why hast thou forsaken me Jesus did for you and me what we deserve for God to do to us. John 3 verse 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I say to you this morning, choose Jesus. Choose life. God's still in the killing business. There's no doubt about that. I can represent him honestly because I have his word and I have observation and I can say without any shadow of a doubt that there's always that possibility that if you will not repent, God may say, I've had it. I'm not putting up with this anymore. I don't know if that's today, but I do know this and I'm saying this honestly. I didn't plan on preaching this message today. But I know that God put it on my heart. And it may be for you. And only you know that. And I want to encourage you to do what the Bible says. Get right with God. Judge yourself. Line up with God and say, God, I, I, I don't want to make you live in a dirty house anymore. I want to get right with you. Would you bow your heads and let's talk to the Lord here this morning? Very sober.